All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our lightning talks this morning. Um, we are going to just go in order uh, by presenter based on what um, we shared. So Sarah Eason will go first and Michael will go last. So um, one quick reminder is just that if you would like to come to MCLS 2022 in Belgium with us, please submit your, submit, uh, your abstracts by Monday. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us on that. Without any further ado, I think I'll hand it off to Sarah Eason. All right, so you can hear me and see my slides, correct? Yep. All right. I see nodding heads, thank you. Um, all right, so today I'm gonna to share some preliminary results from a, a study looking at how parents in rural contexts think about early math learning. Um, and so the you know, motivation for this study is thinking about how the early home environment and families support children's early math outcomes. And I want to draw your attention, especially to the math activities, because it's within activities where there's opportunities for math exploration, where families expose children to math language, which supports their mathematical thinking, as well as convey attitudes about math. And so in the area of family math research, I see there being these like two areas of momentum right now. So first, there's a lot of talk about how we measure it, and then also how we can enhance what families are doing to really support children and ensure that they have high quality math experiences in the home. Um, so there's a lot of talk right now, including previous MCLS sessions, as well as the Hornberg paper that came out in 2021 about whether the ways that we're measuring math engagement right now truly capture what families are doing, especially across diverse contexts. And that has important implications for the intervention research and how we enhance it, because we want to make sure that what we're doing and what we're proposing in interventions fits readily with what families are doing already. And I think this is an exciting area of research because it gives us opportunities to center families themselves in the research and think about implementing studies where we're really looking at what families are doing and how parents are thinking about math opportunities in the home. One aspect of family diversity to think about is the settings in which families live. So for instance, um, the values and traditions that families have in rural contexts, as well as the resources available to them might be different than those in urban or suburban contexts. And this might influence then the types of activities that families engage in and consequently the types of math opportunities that are available. And so with that in mind, we did a survey study with parents in rural counties in both Indiana and North Carolina. Uh, we focused on parents of preschoolers between the ages of three and five. And one of the primary goals for this study was to look at whether some open-ended survey questions could tap into some aspects of how families are thinking and engaging about early math um, beyond what is captured in a lot of the typically used closed-ended inventories. So I'll share some of what we've been looking at with these open-ended responses. Um, so first we were looking at just asking families, what's an activity or routine that you enjoy doing with your child? It doesn't have to, we didn't preface this with math at all. It was just about what are the things that they tend to do and value doing with their children? Um, and so we got a lot of really interesting responses in terms of the things that families tend to do together and coded those for the content to look at what are the, the most common categories. Um, the most common one was parents talking about daily routines, so things like getting ready for the day, getting ready for bed, um, being in transit time together on the way to school or work. And then families also talked a lot about reading, spending time outdoors, and doing things like arts and crafts. So then the next question we asked was, within this activity that you've identified as one that you do and enjoy with your child, where do you see there being opportunities for math learning? And so we also got a wide range of responses here. Um, some families honestly had trouble with it, or in this case, no pun intended, were kind of puzzled by it. Um, in other cases, families mentioned um, a diverse range of different areas of math concepts. And some families gave us these really wonderful in-depth concrete responses. Um, so this is an example of the family that was going swimming and they gave us all of this information about ways that they can incorporate math into that. 
Um, we did code the content for this and found that the most common, not surprisingly, content that they talked about was counting. We then asked, so these are the things that you said that you could do. Um, how often do you incorporate math into this activity? And 80% of parents said that at least sometimes they are incorporating math into this activity. And I think it's also worth noting that only 9% said that there was no math in this activity. So I think that says a lot for how we can build on what families are doing and that they're already you know, primed to think about this and be open to incorporating it. And I'll finish with this correlation table where we're starting to look at um, how these different measures might capture different pieces of the home math environment. So looking at the range of the different concepts that parents used in their open-ended re responses, we found that that was positively correlated with parents' education and negatively correlated with their math anxiety, whereas the frequency with which they actually said that they engage in math in this activity was correlated with how frequently parents reported that their children are choosing to do math activities. And so I think this shows some potential utility to these different items that might get at some different dimensions of how families engage in math and could have some useful implications and insights for developing interventions that align with what families are doing and where parents see there being opportunities. So there's a lot more I could talk about. Um, I'm happy to answer questions in the chat, or um, if you want to continue the conversation, feel free to email me. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'll ask a question. Thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about like the possibility that, you know, there's a perception of like what the desirable answers are on some of these questions and that that might bias parents to respond in a certain way. I guess like I'm a little skeptical that 80% of parents incorporate math into their daily activities. That number seems a little on the high end to me. So yeah, what do you yeah think? Yeah, I, I agree about that. Um, so we do, I think we're going to try to pull this apart a little bit more. Um, we do have a measure that is more of the standard, you know, these are items, how frequently that you do you do these. So um, I think it'll be interesting to look at how those align. Um, and also, I will say that, number one, we set this up so that it, it wasn't prefaced as a math thing. It was, you know, when we asked literacy questions, too. And so I think that'll be helpful for us to look at, too, of um, whether there's some differences in the math and literacy to, um, you know, see if there is just kind of a ceiling, you know, desirable effect. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely something that I'm aware of. And if, if people have thoughts about how we might be able to pull that out of it a bit more. I appreciate it. Sarah, you also have a question in the chat, which was, um, what were the ages of the kids? Yeah, sorry, I went through it quickly. Uh, three to five-year-olds. Great. Any other questions? All right, Elena, I think you can take it over. Okay, sounds great. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Silla. I'm currently a graduate student at the University of Delaware, uh, but today I'll be talking about work that I did at the University of Wisconsin regarding the efficacy of tape diagrams. So conceptual knowledge helps students make connections, which might lead to the use of more efficient strategies and fewer errors while problem solving. For example, a student with conceptual knowledge of algebra might notice connections between the values in this equation and solve it more efficiently. Educational researchers are continually looking for ways to increase conceptual knowledge, as well as mechanisms through which conceptual knowledge can be delivered. One effective mode of delivering instruction is through an intelligent tutoring system or an adaptive computer software that gives immediate feedback on student responses. Intelligent tutoring systems have been shown to boost problem solving ability, uh, but their ability to affect conceptual knowledge is less clear. Some researchers have found that integrating additional interventions in tutors have had a positive effect on conceptual knowledge. 
And one such practice is worked examples or worked out problem solutions. Um, studies have shown that asking students to provide self-explanations for worked examples and explaining the rationale in each step uh, improves their conceptual knowledge of algebra. Other interventions to, to boost conceptual knowledge have been less studied in intelligent tutoring systems. These include tape diagrams, which visually represent parts of the equation. And these also include warm-up activities designed to elicit foundational concepts such as equality. Um, I won't be talking much about warm-ups today, but they were present in the study that I'll be presenting. Uh, so in this study, we investigate whether in interventions administered via an intelligent tutoring system are more effective at fostering conceptual knowledge than a problem-solving control. And we also ask whether specific conceptual knowledge interventions promote uh, conceptual knowledge over and above others. Uh, so as I mentioned, the data was collected as part of a larger study. Um, there were 167 middle school students um, and they completed our one-on-one -on -one virtual study from fall 2020 to spring 2021. Um, this was a two by two plus one design um, and students were randomly assigned to one of five conditions of roughly equal cell size. Um, in all conditions, students completed a pretest assessing conceptual and procedural algebra knowledge. They then solved problems in a tutoring system. So in four of those five conditions, students were presented with correct and incorrect work examples. They were then asked to solve linear equations. Um, and in that fifth condition, the baseline condition, they were only asked to solve those linear equations in the tutor. Some students who received work examples also saw tape diagrams while they were explaining work examples and solving equations. Um, these tape diagrams were designed to provide scaffolds for conceptual understanding. Some students also saw warm-ups and some saw both tape diagrams and warm-ups. So to answer our first research question, do interventions administered via an intelligent tutoring system foster conceptual understanding more than a problem-solving control? We looked at conceptual knowledge post-test scores of all of the students who received an intervention um, compared to those in the baseline condition, controlling for pretest. And students in those four intervention conditions on average did have greater conceptual gains than those in the baseline condition. So our first hypothesis that students who received interventions would have higher conceptual gains than those in the baseline was supported. So then we looked at gains um, within those four intervention conditions. So students who only saw worked examples, students who also saw tape diagrams, students who also saw warmups, and those who had all of the interventions. Um, and conceptual knowledge did not actually differ between those conditions. However, when we looked at student response data in the tutor, we did notice some interesting differences between the intervention conditions. So in the graph I'm going to show you, um, on the x-axis is the problem in the tutor, and on the y-axis is the error rate. Students had multiple steps that they had to solve in the tutor in order to finish the equation. So the error rate is the percentage of errors made compared to the overall number of steps in each equation. And students who solved problems with tape diagrams had a lower error rate than those who did not have tape diagrams while solving problems. And this difference still appeared even when we removed steps with diagrams to make the two types of steps identical between those two groups. Um, and one thing we noticed um, kind of anecdotally is that tape diagrams do appear to help students avoid making errors when doing subtraction or subtracting a variable. Um, and this is of note because preliminary data shows that students do prefer tape diagrams to represent subtraction dynamically like you see on the screen. Um, and so there might be a relationship between this representation and student performance, so that might be something we look at later. So in some conceptual interventions, especially work examples administered via an intelligent tutoring system, did support conceptual understanding of algebra, um, which lends support to implementing more interventions via tutoring systems and also supports some prior literature. There was less support for tape diagrams and warm-ups in the tutor, but we did see a difference in student performance data um, related to tape diagrams. So they may have had an effect and further research might help us um, kind of investigate that role of tape diagrams in the tutor. And that's what I have. Thank you all so much. Great. Thank you, Elena. Mm -hmm. uh, what questions do we have for Elena? Uh, this is Renee Grimes. So have you looked at the log data to see if there were particular um, particular questions that the tape diagrams um, were particularly more helpful in solving than others? 
Yeah, um, I don't know that we've gone that fine grained yet. Um, that is something that we're hoping to look at. We've kind of looked at overall scores um, and how they've varied between problems. Um, but that's a really good point. There might be some linear equations that uh, maybe more complex ones, tape diagrams would be more helpful for. Um, so that's definitely something we'll look at. Thank you. Um, just a question and an idea. Have you looked at, uh, so it looks like you looked at um, accuracy and error rate, right? Mm -hmm. And so how about response time? I would suspect that like students who get the warm up and the tape diagram may take more time, but at the same time, maybe tape diagram is helpful and get them faster and more efficient at solving problems. And so um, I don't know if I have particular hypothesis on which direction it's going to go, but maybe that's something you can look into as well. Yeah, thank you so much. We have looked briefly at response time and kind of um, analyses are still um, going on about this project, but um, I can't remember off the top of my head what we saw, but I do think that students who saw tape diagrams and warm ups took longer. I can't remember the rest of the effect, but thank you for that suggestion. That's helpful. Great. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Teresa, you are up. Uh, assume sound is good. Just yep. see if we can get the presentation up. Stop looking all right for everybody. Yes? Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right, yeah, hi. My name is Teresa. I'm a PhD student at Loughborough University. And today I quickly want to introduce a paper that we wrote last year. And I just want to walk you through sort of the, the main findings. So first of all, a quick reminder, this should be something that most people are familiar with, but I just wanna kind of preface a few things before I get into the paper. So if we look at enumeration processes, there's usually you know, the big three that we always talk about, which is estimation. We have a, a large number of items. And if we very quickly wanna tell how many there are, we can do this in sort of an inaccurate fashion. So if you look at these green dots here, you could say, oh, there's probably like between 10 and 15 dots. If you have some more time and you can do it more accurately, you can actually count them one by one. You could tell there's exactly 12 dots in this picture, but it would take you a much longer time. And if we have items, uh, if we have smaller sets of items, we can use yet another process, which is called subitizing, where if you see these three dots here, you didn't have to count them and you can tell exactly it is three. There's no uncertainty or estimation around that. But that subitizing process sort of only works for small numbers of items. So you couldn't look at the first picture with that large number of dots and do this. So, now I want to show you another picture and just as a little activity here for everybody, just try to figure out how many dots there are. Does anybody have an answer? 16. Wow, well done. Was that Ilsa? Nice. You're the winner today. <laughs> so there are indeed 16 dots and I only showed them to you for really a fraction of a second, correct? So if we think about our enumeration processes, it seems to be neither of these because we have a lot of dots, but you were able to tell me the exact accurate number and do it in a really fast time. So what we're looking at here has been termed groupatizing, which is the effect that we see when um, enumeration is facilitated if an array is structured into some form of clustering. So now we can enumerate it really fast, really accurately. 
So I have another question for everybody. If you were able to tell that it's 16 dots, how did you do it? Four times four. Four times four. I assume that's probably what, what a few people have done. And it's also something that uh, Lawrence and Chacon and Sasa Stehan have found in a recently published paper where they also suggest that the groupatizing mechanism somewhat relies on mental arithmetic, that we are doing these mathematical operations to be able to tell exactly and very quickly how many items are in a grouped array. And what we've been wondering with this recent study is, well, how do you know that it's four groups with four dots each? So what is the process that allows you to retrieve these operands to then use mental multiplication or some other form of arithmetic to retrieve that exact number? And what we found is that <clears throat> you can actually, or people can actually use the subitizing process to tell, oh, oh yeah, there we go, <laughs> to tell that there are four groups. So you are able to draw on this very fast and accurate capacity to enumerate small sets of items to tell it's four groups. And you're also able to use that subitizing process to tell that there is four dots in each group, which allows you to have these two operands to then use for mental multiplication. And our suggestion why we think that it is subitizing is because we have, again, presented people with these arrays with a very, very short amount of time, 150 milliseconds, and we see that their accuracy is like 85% or higher with telling how many items, dots, or groups there are. And what we further found is that it appears that these processes happen at the same time so that the accuracy isn't actually uh, decreased or impacted if you have to do both at the same time as would be necessary to retrieve both operands for this mental multiplication. And further, while you're doing this at the same time, it appears that neither process is sort of dominant over the other, but you appear to subitize both the groups and the number of dots per group, kind of in parallel and with equal priority. Yeah, to just quickly summarize this, we were wondering whether um, subitizing could be a process that is involved in groupatizing, specifically for retrieving operands for mental multiplication. So we've only looked at these arrays that would allow you to use mental multiplication. And we've published this paper. So if you want to know anything more about the specific methodology, it's all written up, it's all there, but I'm obviously also happy to answer any questions. Thank you. How do I unshare my screen? Sorry, that's a stupid question. Oh, yeah, there's a button. <laughs> hey, Teresa, it's Joanne Lefebvre. I have a question. Um, given what you found, and we found similar things, so I think it's pretty pretty st stable. Do you think it's useful? Do you think the term groupatizing is useful? Because in the original use of that term um, back, uh, who was it? Star and McCandless, I think. Um, they implied that it was a sort of a higher level form of subitizing, but I think what your results show is that it's subitizing plus multiplication. So do you see groupatizing as a useful term? Mm, yeah, I, I've been also grappling with that question. And I think it, it is useful in the sense that it describes an, an interesting phenomenon, but I don't think it describes a uniform phenomenon. So I think there's various forms of mechanisms involved in what we collectively call groupatizing. But then um, what you've seen here in this study, we've used these arrays that are very structured and we have these identical groups. So it like very much facilitates this idea of, yeah, subitizing and then mental arithmetic. But there's also other studies that look at 
various forms of clustering or also clustering that is not spatial. And I think we just need, need more work to disentangle what is kind of shared between these phenomena where enumeration is facilitated and what's maybe specific to how the array is structured. But yeah, I think just calling that all collectively groupatizing might hide how different these things are sometimes. Okay, thank you. Oh, thanks, Renee, for putting that in the chat. I'll have a look at that. Do we have any other questions for Teresa? Um, I don't know whether Michelle wanted to say more about conceptual supervising, but maybe just like one quick thought on that. Um, like I said to Joanne's question, I think this is all sort of in, in the same same realm of things but yeah we yeah kind of next steps would be to to disentangle what it is really when when young children appear to acquire this this capability of being faster at enumerating structured arrays and recognizing that numerical structure and this like part whole relationship and then you know how that relates to these findings that we have with adults and when mental arithmetic comes into play, I think that's that's really interesting. And there are a lot of interesting studies to happen, I think, in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Teresa. Uh, Sarah Pan, you can go next. Does that look, that look, that look good? Yep. Okay, great. Well, good morning. Um, I'm Sarah, a grad student from the University of Minnesota, and I'm gonna be talking about children's contextual sensitivity to number word interpretation. Um, okay, so broadly speaking, language and math, uh, there's lots of links that researchers have found between those constructs. Um, one very specific aspect of that relationship that we're focusing on is children's interpretation of number words in context. Um, so interpreting number words is not always straightforward. Uh, sometimes it is, like in the case of tangible individual items like bowls, um, but it's less straightforward when talking about continuous quantities like measurements, intangible reference like age or time, or when using combinatorial words. Um, so this sort of leads us into our research questions that we had. Um, so how might context influence children's numerical thinking? Um, specifically, do children in grades K to two interpret number words literally when making these magnitude judgments, such as four always being greater than three, regardless of the surrounding context? Um, and secondarily, we ask if reliance on this context when making these judgments is potentially mediating the relationship between language and math, and if it's independent of uh, vocabulary and executive, executive function skills. Um, so today I focus primarily on the first question, but we do some exploration of the second in our results. Um, so to measure this sort of contextual sensitivity to number word interpretation, we use a novel measure, um, the numerical ambiguity interpretation task or the NATE, which I will talk about in detail. So in the NATE, uh, participants are presented with images of two children and two sets of items. So one set for each child. Um, and then participants were asked, uh, for example, Casey sees four bears and Jackie sees two cages of bears, who sees more? So the goal of these straightforward control trials are to see if children can do these magnitude judgments in unambiguous settings. So this would be an example of a numerically congruent trial. Um, Casey sees more bears and four is greater than two. Uh, some of the control trials only had one number word, some included an adjective, uh, but generally overall, children were able to uh, answer correctly on average 95% of the time in these straightforward cases. So they can make these comparisons uh, in the task at baseline. Um, so the test conditions introduced some ambiguity. So numerically incongruent questions paired the larger number word with the smaller set. So for example, Casey eats four muffins, Jackie eats three bags of muffins, 
who eats more muffins. So in this case, children might suppose that Casey ate more muffins because four is greater than three. But in fact, uh, the image that they're shown uh, shows that Jackie has six muffins and three bags. So the questions are un unambiguous in terms of the visual presentation, but a little bit ambiguous in terms of the numbers being used to describe those sets. Um, other questions were ambiguous because you can't see the items in the containers. So comparing four hats and two bins of hats, but you don't know how many hats are in each bin. Um, the correct answer to those sorts of questions would be some form of, I don't know. Um, and children may feel like we expect them to answer with one or the other, Jackie or Casey in this case, um, but our warm up does introduce that they can say, I don't know when that's appropriate. Um, so generally in this task, we're not interested in whether children are answering correctly, um, but whether they're responding solely based on these number words, irrespective of the context. So these sorts of responses like choosing four muffins or four hats are called large number word bias responses. Um, the purpose then of test three and four trials are to elicit these I don't know responses instead of the large number word bias ones. So these trials including having completely different items for the kids, so three toothbrushes and two combs, or having items differ from the prompt question, so four apples, three apples, who has more balloons? Um, so the large number of bias response, uh, responses here would be three toothbrushes or four apples, um, even though the context is either ambiguous or illogical. Um, additional extremely illogical trials without number words at all were also included to see if children would eventually say, I don't know, in those extreme cases, um, such as only showing Jackie and Casey's faces and saying something like Casey has pajamas, Jackie has pajamas, who has more nightlights, and children were generally on average uh, able to say, I don't know, in 70% of those trials. So they will say, I don't know, if they are uh, given an extremely illogical setup. Okay, so our final sample included 268 children uh, in kindergarten to second grade recruited from one public school district in Minneapolis. Uh, along with an eight, we also ran sort of standard measures to look at math ability, receptive vocab, and EF. So um, we found that among our sample, there were sort of a range of these large number word bias responses out of the possible 24 in the task. Um, Rates of the responses was significantly related to kids' uh, receptive vocabulary, but not their EF. Um, and while there was a large range of responses within each individual grade level, uh, overall responses decreased uh, by grade, though this effect was pretty small and only significant for kindergarten and grade two comparisons. Um, individual differences by grade are then better captured by a latent profile analysis that we did. Um, based on the rate of large number word bias responses. So we do see some potential differences in how these four groups are responding to the different types of test questions. Um, we found no overall correlation between these large number word bias responses and math ability if all the participants were included as one group, but these extreme profile groups did have uh, differences there. So using a t-test, we found that TEMA scores differed between the most and the fewest groups or the, the red and the purple on this figure right here. Um, though these groups combined are a pretty small percent of the total sample, only about 9%. Um, this effect seems to be partly explained by grade because there were no kindergartners in the fewest group and fewer second graders in the most group, um, but there's still some uh, individual differences in profile membership uh, as shown at, in the variation in that table. Um, so overall, individual differences and large number word bias responses may reflect some variation in children's use of context to decipher what number words are conveying. Um, these responses are seemingly not reflecting EF, indicating a unique relationship between language and early math in these responses in the task. Uh, and while there was limited evidence uh, relating these responses to math ability broadly, group differences did emerge in our profile analysis. So further analyses will involve parsing that very large uh, average latent profile group primarily by exploring Nate's potential role as a mediator um, between language and math. And uh, additionally, we will look at the data longitudinally in the future. So using Nate to predict math in future time points. Um, and that's what I have, thank you. Great job, Sarah. Uh, what questions do we have for Sarah? I, Teresa, go ahead. Hi, yeah, really, really interesting. Uh, I'm wondering sort of what kind of uh, constitutes the responses that are correct responses, right? Like, what, what do you mm. think about those? Because I could imagine that, you know, children, currently what their mistake is, or the mistake that you highlight is that they're using the number words rather than the provided pictures. 
I could also imagine that, you know, children find that there's an incongruency between the picture and the number word when they count the muffins and find, oh, this isn't three muffins, it's, what was it, six mm -hmm. muffins. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's like an extra step involved in sort of finding out that the number word doesn't refer to the muffins. Have you seen any of this in your data? Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, yeah, the trials definitely differ in like what is correct versus incorrect, just be, like the nature of uh, like the, the I don't know responses were correct when it was like totally illogical or inappropriate to, to give an answer. But some of the ones like you were highlighting potentially, um, there is some ambiguity in what the question is even asking. So in that case, there isn't like a wrong answer necessarily. But um, the, my the example that comes to mind is like the three toothbrushes, uh, two combs. Um, they're sort of asked who has more. So in that case, they might interpret it as more objects. Uh, generally, in that case, it's not exactly wrong to say three, but it's more ambiguous. So um, yeah, definitely interesting to think about how the different trials are eliciting sort of different uh, thought processes, I guess, in answering those. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Can I see the profile analysis? Um, yeah. Of course. Thank you. Um, so I guess I can start like thinking about my question. So, okay. So here, um, I think like profile analysis, like one of my typical question with profile analysis is that are they really qualitatively different or are they just at the different end of continuum? Um, mm. So for example, like uh, the most yeah. versus the fewest, maybe they're just at the different end of continuum. I don't know. Um, so that's kind of like one, uh, yeah, are, are they qualitatively different? And then um, another, I guess, question is thinking about um, are these um, kind of illustrating a developmental progression of like going from mm. the fewest to like the, um, the, under the upside down V shape um, yeah. profile and then to the highest threat one. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts or ideas on those questions or comments. Yeah, no, definitely. Those are great, great thoughts. Um, I do think that there, there's some element of developmental progression in these uh, responses, just sort of qualitatively, you can tell by the, the profile, sort of the membership, older kids are generally making fewer of these. Uh, responses, and I'm sure if you traced to older, even older kids, like an adult would be most likely to, to tell you the, the proper responses. Um, so I definitely think there's some element of that in this. Um, in terms of the profiles being qualitatively different, uh, I will say that I think, um, like looking at the, the standard TEMA scores here, like they're all within like an average range. So um, within sort of like a couple one or two standard deviations of the mean, I think. So So there is definitely similarities across these groups. They're not necessarily super different. Um, the ranges of the large number of bias responses overlap between groups. Um, but I think there, there could be something, the most interesting part of that to me is sort of how they're responding to these different types of test questions. Um, like this is the one I was talking about before where the set items are sort of different, but this is the one like the muffin question where if you are able to make that comparison just by counting the items, you should be able to be answering that one without making these biased responses. So um, I would say that there's potentially some differences by um, test item in that way uh, that are worth further exploring, but it's a yeah. great, great Sounds thoughts. Great. Yeah. Super yeah. exciting. Thank you. There is one question in the chat, which I think you've kind of already addressed, but um, just to say it out loud, do you think it's sure. about number words per se or the combinatorial nature with number words and unit of measurement? That's a great, that's a great, great question. Um, so like I mentioned up front, there's definitely, we were sort of predicting that this contextual sensitivity would be mediating um, potentially language or numerical skills uh, and how that relates to, to math ability. Um, and I do think like, the language, the linguistic aspect of it is definitely inherently that they're tied together. You can't really separate them out. Um, yeah, so I, I think there, there are, there is some element of that in there. Um, but um, yeah, 
yeah i mean that's a great question i'll have to think about it some more but that yeah that there's definitely like that that figure i showed before where the, all the things are related um yeah yeah it's a great question though I also had a question. Um, so okay. uh, you talked about uh, how it was not related to your EF composite, correct? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what, which EF components were in your composite and why oh, sure. the composite rather than the individual components? Yeah, so we used uh, HDKS, which is head, toes, knees, shoulders, uh, and the MEFs. I don't know if you're familiar with those measures, but they're they're sort of getting at uh, inhibitory control, um, cognitive flexibility, uh, things that seemed individually to to uh, refer to individual EF skills, and we we use them together because they both seemed um, relevant. But um, yeah, yeah, it was interesting that it was not related because we thought that it it would be you know some element of of this mediation, but. Um, I think it it talks it talks to the sort of inherent numerical abilities of kids and their um, maybe independent language skills separate from their their EF cognitive abilities um, in that way. But it would be interesting to maybe look at those EF measures separately instead of together. Um, I don't know if I've done a lot of that, but that could be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Okay, any last questions for Sarah? All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, so Amandine and Brian are actually unable to be with us today. So um, Michael, we are going to hand it over to you. All righty, I'm just gonna share my screen. Can everyone see it okay? Yep. Yeah, perfect. Cool, so today I'm gonna to be talking about a study that uh, I did in conjunction with the McCourt School of Public Policy uh, and my home department of psychology. And we're specifically interested in how math and science attitudes develop. So how they're actually changing together over time. Um, and we're interested in those because they're both important for STEM careers. So we're specifically asking what's the directionality of development. So are early math attitudes predicting later science attitudes? Are we seeing early science attitudes predict later math attitudes? Or are we seeing this sort of reciprocal relationship where both are predicting each other over time? Um, and we're also looking to examine whether or not uh, later attitudes predict STEM career membership later on. So are these you know, sort of verifying, are these attitudes early on still important? We're using data from the longitudinal study of American youth. Uh, it was originally collected in 1987, 1994, and then they followed up in 2007, 2011. Um, that's where we get sort of this both in school uh, measures of student attitudes uh, from grade seven to grade 12, but we also get that career membership of uh, whether or not they ended up in STEM later on. Uh, and we have a sample of almost 3000 students. Our attitudes metrics for both science and math are actually just an average of three Likert scale variables. So whether they like math, whether they're good at math, and whether they understand math. Uh, and it's meant to get a composite sort of broad structure um, in terms of are these students tending to be people who have more positive attitude. Uh, and STEM career membership is a binary. Uh, in terms of our analytical approach, we actually use the random intercept cross leg panel model to distinguish between and within effects. And I'll sort of walk you through what that actually means. Um, but if you're not familiar with it, this is sort of what it looks like for our data here. So we have math uh, attitudes from grade seven to grade 12, and we have science attitudes at the bottom from grade seven to grade 12, and we have one, one time point per year collected in the fall. And the traditional cross-leg panel model would really just look at the, the autoregressive and the cross-leg correlations. Uh, and the problem with that is that it collapses the between and within effects. So it doesn't take into account people, some people are just gonna tend to like subjects more over time. Um, and by collapsing that, we don't actually get a good picture of the developmental trajectory. Um, so in this case, we're actually predicting significant autoregressive and cross-leg paths and a strong between subjects correlation. And for that model, what that means is we're predicting in this within subject section that we're gonna see uh, strong relationships from earlier math to later math. 
Um, so people who like math early on are gonna, that's gonna have a positive effect later on. Uh, same thing with science. Uh, but we're also predicting that we also predicted that we would see significant cross leg relationships across domains. Um, so earlier science would have a positive effect. So liking science more early on would have a positive effect, cause you to like science more later uh, in math as well, or like, si or like math more. Um, and so in this model, the within subjects uh, components are here, the between subjects components are here, and the correlations up here. And what's actually happening is we're decomposing the observed variables, those square variables, into latent variables for between, um, so one single latent construct for a random intercept, uh, and occasion-specific latent variables for that within. In terms of our actual results, these are our actual results. Um, and what we see is that earlier math attitudes tend to predict later math attitudes. So that's sort of in line with what we we're thinking. Uh, if you like it more earlier on, we're seeing developmental changes, you're going to like it more later. We tend to see, again, that same pattern uh, for science. What we do not see is any real co-development, uh, any real reciprocal relationships across time. So it doesn't seem to be the case that science attitudes are having a positive effect later on on math attitudes and vice versa. And just to clarify here, I should have said this at the start, but uh, for these images here, for my models here, for the depictions, uh, dotted lines are not significant at the 5% level, uh, solid lines are significant at the 5% level, and I'm showing standardized coefficients. Um, and I should note that we do see a significant uh, correlation uh, in the between subjects random intercept components, meaning that people who do tend to like math more uh, also tend to like science more. It's just not that we're seeing uh, any evidence of a developmental relationship uh, where earlier math would predict later science or vice versa. We then build this out to look at whether or not grade 12 with in-person uh, science uh, and math attitudes predict STEM career membership later on. Uh, and we do see that. We see very similar effects across both. Um, the students who have positive attitudes in grade 12 towards math and science uh, are predicting whether or not they end up in STEM. So people who like math and science grade 12 more likely to end up in STEM. And so in terms of concluding thoughts, we see that this development seems to be happening uh, largely within a significant, or within these academic domains uh, with earlier attitudes predicting later attitudes. Um, and we also see that both are important for STEM. Uh, in terms of implications, uh, this just, just goes to show that interventions and policies aimed at increasing one type of STEM domain are unlikely to see developmental spillover uh, by just targeting one domain. Uh, and it also really goes to show that early attitudes are important for both domains, uh, and they're both significant for predicting later STEM membership. Of course, this data is limited, and it's collected in the 80s and 90s, uh, and uh, we have defined attitudes quite broadly. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to ask now or follow up afterwards. Thank you, Michael. What questions do we have for Michael? I see one in the chat. Do we want to start with that one? Um, so Sarah Eason asked, the smaller coefficient from grade eight math to grade nine math is interesting. Might this have to do with transition to high school and there being other factors at this particular time point? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, and I should have probably said this at the start. I've, I've tried in the, the interpretation of this data is to not overinterpret any one coefficient just because we're looking at so many coefficients. So it's unclear exactly um, whether or not that is a developmental trend. But I would speculate that, yeah, in terms of both math and science, we see smaller coefficients uh, from that transition to grade eight to nine. So it's very possible that other things are going on here as well. I have a kind of a general question. Uh, so in terms of STEM careers, like as the, an outcome, are there, um, like, did you think about trying to separate careers into more science focused or more math focused careers to see if those were different? It's a, that's a really good question. And we thought about it. Um, we sort of run into two problems. The first is that in this case, we're just using STEM careers as they're defined by the LSAY as their broad construct. Um, and because it's a longitudinal study collected over such a long period of time, the sample size for STEM careers is, is quite small. Um, I think there's only about 1,500 of the people who actually responded at the end. 
And the very vast bulk of those people are not STEM careers. So I think it's only about 7% uh, that end up actually in a STEM career. So we're just talking about really, really split um, samples when we start asking those questions. So that's why we didn't end up going with that in this case. But it's a really good point. And I, I would expect there probably would be differences. Great, thank you. We have other questions for Michael. All right. Thank you so much, Michael, for that presentation. Thank you, everyone. Um, do we have we have a few minutes left if anyone wants to add in any other general questions or thoughts for anyone? If not, I will. Oh, yeah, Michelle, go ahead. I didn't want to ask if someone else had a question. I have a, a comment for Sarah Eason. Um, if we could go back in time to talking about math attitudes for younger kids. Um, Sarah, that was a, such a nice talk. All of the talks were great. So I want to thank everybody for their talks. And Sarah, um, I especially appreciated, um, I believe that you prefaced the math specific questions with a question about what are your routines or something like that. I remember the figure. And um, I just really liked that approach. And I wanted to ask you if that was a mechanism to put parents at ease when talking about where math might occur or to maybe nudge them into places where it might likely be. Could you just talk a little bit more about that rationale of that design? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's definitely an, a potential like added benefit to it to think about how it is like recognizing the value of them just being parents and interacting with them and engaging with their kids. Um, the reason for it was that, you know, I, I kind of was backing up from thinking about as we develop interventions that that idea of wanting to meet families where they are and incorporate things into what they're already doing. And I think there's, um, you know, been some consideration of that, but in particular with developing interventions potentially for specific context, you know, are the things that we're thinking that families do really what they are doing? Um, and along with that understanding what, what's the value that they have? Like, why do they choose to do certain activities and so we have a bunch of other questions that I haven't really gone through yet about why, why is this an activity that you like? What are the things about this that you value? And my thought with that is that that could also help as we frame interventions in the future to align with what are the things that families find, you know, important so that we can, you know, be making this like tied in with that. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Thank you. All right, great. Well, huge round of applause for all of our presenters today. Thank you all so much. This was very interesting. Um, and just as a reminder, we have um, submissions for the MCLS 2022 conference in Belgium due on Monday. So please submit, we hope to see you all there. Um, and otherwise we hope to see you next week at our next virtual meeting on Thursday. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you all so much. <laughs>